It's early in the year 46 BC. After the decisive defeat at Thapsus, all seemed lost for the Optimates. Most of their prominent members were either dead or fleeing. A large portion of their armies was either destroyed or captured, while any remaining troops scattered. But despite all of these disastrous setbacks, the old political order of Rome proved to be a very hard nut to crack. The Optimates will soon prove that they still have some fight left in them. And for today's video, we partnered up with our friends over at Simply Safe. I wanted to improve my home security for some time, and Simply Safe were kind enough to let me try out their system. It was incredibly simple to set up, without any need to drill holes and set up cables, and after using it for over a month, it proved to be very reliable in keeping my home safe 24 7. Simply Safe's home security is packed with features. You can monitor your home even while you're away, using the mobile app to spot unwanted guests. My favorite is the keychain remote that allows me to control my home security system with the press of a button. It is an awesome addition to the main keypad panel that controls the system. An array of easy-to-install sensors provide multi-layered protection, and the system also detects water leaks, floods, smoke, and carbon monoxide, and notifies me if the door or a window is left open. Best yet, Simply Safe system will automatically call emergency services if needed. If you're looking to make your home a safer place, check out Simply Safe's award-winning home security using the link in the description below. Two of Pompey Magnus's sons, Gnaeus and Sextus, together with Titus Labinus, a former Caesarian who turned against him, managed to escape the Caesar's onslaught after their defeat at Thapsus. They made their way to Spain and slowly began to recruit new legions in order to, once more, renew the hostilities against their nemesis. A couple of Pompey's former veteran legions that were stationed in Hispania Alteria had declared themselves for the Optimates and drove out Caesar's proconsul. Those two legions were soon joined by the remnants of the army that was defeated in the North African campaign. By combining their forces, they managed to occupy most of the province, including the capital, Cordoba. It didn't take long after that for the Optimates to swell their ranks with newly recruited levies from Roman citizens of the region and from local Spanish inhabitants, as well as former slaves who were disillusioned with Caesarian authorities. Caesar again had a full-scale crisis on his hands. The civil war has resurged within just a few months after his victory at Thapsus. But this time around, the leader of the Populares faced unique issues. Most of his veterans, after years of service and numerous campaigns, were disbanded and retired. The majority of his loyal and so often victorious veterans would not follow their general to Spain. Nevertheless, Caesar's favorite and most loyal legion, the 10th, despite being severely under strength due to years of campaigning and accumulated losses, together with the 5th legion, that so successfully managed to counter the attack of the enemy elephants during the Battle of Thapsus, were amongst those who would follow Caesar to what would ultimately prove to be his final campaign. Caesar arrived in Spain in early December 46 BC, after an epic march of almost 2400 kilometers, which his army covered in less than a month, a march that according to some ancient sources, Caesar commemorated in a short poem that he wrote. When his presence became known to the region, many ambassadors approached him with a variety of requests. 
The ambassadors from Cordoba urged him to march straight to their city and relieve it from the enemy who they claimed was not yet aware of his presence. But at the same time, survivors from the garrison of Ulia, beseeching Caesar to relieve the city that was under siege by Gnaeus Pompey for some months now. Caesar thought it more prudent to march to relieve Ulia first, since its citizens remained loyal under pressure. He detached eleven cohorts with a small cavalry force, under the command of Julius Passiesus, and sent them during the night to lift the siege of Ulia. When the detachment arrived near Ulia, a severe tempest arose that reduced visibility to within just a few meters. Thinking quickly, Passiesus ordered his men to attempt to sneak from within Pompey's entrenchments, marching with his cavalry in a very thin formation. After a Pompeian guard became aware of their presence and required them to identify themselves, one of Passiesus' legionnaires yelled at him to be silent, telling him that they were attempting to capture the walls. The trick worked, and the Caesareans managed to enter the city. Thanks to Passiesus' cunning and the audacity of a single legionnaire, the siege of Ulia was lifted. When Caesar received news of this success, he immediately set off towards Cordoba. He quickly built a bridge and forded the river Calda Severe, setting his camp not far from the city. Pompey rushed to intercept Caesar and set his camp just opposite of his rival's position, across the bridge. As was typical for Caesar, he attempted to completely block off his enemy from gaining access to the bridge by having his soldiers dig an extended trench from his camp. As a result, a series of bloody skirmishes ensued across the bridge. The Pompeians tried to gain access to the bridge, and the Caesareans tried to block it off. So severe were the losses for both sides due to the narrow space in which they fought, that heaps of bodies piled up on both sides of the bridge. Caesar realized that Pompey would not commit to an open and decisive battle, so he did not linger for long. He instructed his soldiers to light many fires to distract and deceive the enemy into thinking that the entire force was in the camp. Then, during that same night, he forded the river and marched against the city of Ategua, which was the strongest fort that the Optimates had in the area. The veterans immediately began to besiege the town of Ategua, forcing the new recruits to follow their lead and accustom themselves with the heavy workload that was typical of the Caesarian way of waging war. It wasn't long after that a series of ditches and ramparts had fully surrounded the town. Around the same time, Pompey, who was informed of Caesar's departure and was marching to the aid of Ategua, happened to stumble upon a strong detachment of enemy cavalry during some heavy mist and completely destroyed it. Despite his success, most of the strategic eminences around the area were already occupied by Caesareans, so he was forced to bypass them and encamp himself in between Ategua and the nearby city of Eucubus, upon some hills overlooking the enemy positions. From his position, Pompey could not assist the defenders, so was in urgent need of a plan. After he assessed the situation, he came up with a plan of immediate action. There, across a nearby river, he saw a weakly defended hill that overlooked the town, as well as Caesar's communication lines, and, because of the nature of the ground and the intervening river, he thought that Caesar would not be able to reinforce the position in case of a surprise attack. Driven by this belief, he sent a strong detachment in a dramatic night march to storm the enemy's position and dislodge the Caesareans. Things did not go according to Pompey's plan, though. When his legionnaires reached the position, 
The defenders were ready and showered them with their peeler from a favorable and elevated position. With the surprise being unsuccessful, the ensuing skirmish gave enough time to Caesar to react. Three legions from the main camp rushed to the aid of their comrades, and the Pompeians were caught in between the two forces. After a brief struggle, the Pompeians fled after losing about a hundred men during the flight. The losses would have probably been more severe if the attack happened during daylight. After the failure of the surprise attack, Pompey changed his tactics and attempted to force his way across the river and onto the strategically located hill. He began digging a line across his camp to the nearby river, in order for his army to be able to safely reach the other side. Once again, skirmishes ensued around the entrenchments, but Pompey's army was eventually able to reach the river and even build a new fort on the opposite bank. The no man's land between the two opposing fortifications became a place of severe and intense clashes, with neither side being able to achieve a major victory, and both armies sustained minor setbacks. Pompey needed to break the stalemate and relieve the town from his enemy. During the night, he managed to sneak messages to the besieged, imploring them to assemble and attack a specific point of Caesar's fortifications, in the hope that they could break out and unite with his forces outside. The garrison of Ategua complied and tried a desperate breakthrough out of Caesar's chokehold, but the effort was in vain. The Caesarian army proved to be way too prepared and capable of repulsing the attempt. After a brief clash, in which the garrison sustained heavy losses, it was eventually forced to retreat in disarray back within its walls. After the failed breakthrough attempt, Pompey decided that he could do nothing more for the besieged. Preparations began to break camp and march towards the western part of the province, where there were numerous well-defended allied cities and towns that he could assist and defend more effectively. Caesar intercepted this intelligence and decided to inform the inhabitants of the besieged city about Pompey's decision to abandon them. And, as he had correctly predicted, it didn't take long before a letter arrived from Governor L. Menatius who offered to surrender the town, as long as he received guarantees that their lives would be spared, which Caesar granted. The siege of Ategua was successfully concluded in February of 45 BC. The fall of this key fortress incited a cascade of defections around the whole province in favor of Caesar's cause. Pompey was retreating towards the city of Ucubus, and Caesar remained hot on his heels. After crossing yet another river close to Ucubus, Pompey decided to encamp yet again and began entrenching himself on defendable hilly area. The two armies were soon engaged in a ferocious skirmish near the fordable area of the river, during which the Caesarians were overwhelmed and pushed back. Two of Caesar's veteran centurions made a heroic last stand in an attempt to slow down the Pompeian countercharge. Their eventual deaths gave enough time to the opposing Caesarian horsemen who were rushing out of their camp to intervene, and in their turn drove the Pompeians back to their own entrenchments. Both adversaries were carefully maneuvering, attempting to defend their lines while at the same time endeavoring to exploit any weakness and strike a knockout blow to the enemy. After marching a few miles westwards, both armies stopped and began to dig in. Pompey encamped just outside the city of Ucubus, and Caesar a few miles to the north. He immediately set his legionnaires to dig a protracted ditch along the communication and supply routes of his enemy, that ran towards the city of Aspavia, just off to the north of his position. 
After Pompey observed this, he immediately perceived the seriousness of the situation and decided to hazard an engagement against the Caesarian forces. But he remained wary and cautious enough to march along the hills and attempt to provoke an engagement from a favorable, elevated position. The exact description of what happened next is lost to us, but it is reasonable to assume that Caesar's forces managed to dislodge the Pompeians from their position, and that they were only saved by the onset of darkness. It was around that time that letters sent from Pompey to his allies in nearby cities were intercepted. In them he described a switch in his strategy, and that from now on he would attempt to defend every allied city, intending to hinder Caesar's army from using them as supply depots and provision sources that it so desperately needed. Pompey continued to retreat to the western side of the province, and Caesar followed him closely, managing to capture the city of Ventisponte during the pursuit. The commander of the Optimates, being faithful to his aforementioned strategy, has set out to enact it, burning the nearby city of Karuka when its garrison refused to open the gates to him, and from there marching southwards to the nearby town of Munda, where he positioned his army upon the mountainous area to the immediate vicinity of the town. Caesar, still on the pursuit, arrived in the plains of Munda and pitched his camp opposite to that of Pompey. The next day, while Caesar was preparing to once again set out with his army, scout reports stated that Pompey's army was arranged in battle order ever since midnight. Julius Caesar ordered for the battle standard to be raised immediately. The final showdown of the largest and most catastrophic civil war of the ancient world was imminent. The two camps were divided from one another by a plain extending about five miles. Pompey enjoyed a double defense of sorts due to the nature of the country and because the town was situated on elevated ground. Across this valley ran a small river or rivulet, which rendered the approach to the mountain very difficult. Due to perfect weather conditions on the day, Pompey's numerical superiority and the flat plain that lay between them, Caesar thought that moving towards his already arrayed enemy would entice him to move down from his hill and engage in battle. But Pompey stayed put, and it soon became obvious that the commander of the Optimates would not dare leave the high ground, even though Caesar's army was composed largely of new recruits. When they reached the edge of the plain, which was the most disadvantageous location to initiate a battle, Caesar pointed that out to his largely inexperienced troops. The subsequent delay of their advance enlivened the Pompeians, who advanced a little way, but without abandoning their advantageous position. Cautiously but steadily, Caesar's legions began the slow upward march towards Pompey's position. The army of the Optimates consisted of thirteen legions arranged in three lines. The cavalry that was about 6,000 men strong was positioned on the wings and was commanded by Titus Labinus, with an equal number of light troops dispersed among them. In total, the Pompeian army numbered around 70,000 men. During that day, Julius Caesar led a total of eight legions that were almost at their full strength, numbering around 40,000 men and he also had a slight numerical advantage in cavalry, with a total of 8,000 horsemen under his command, who were all placed on his left wing. His infantry was arranged in the usual triple line, with the elite 10th legion of veterans occupying its usual position on the right wing, with the 5th and 3rd legion on his left. The battle that was about to come was to be, by far, the largest clash of the civil war in terms of scale. 
But the main bulk of the Caesarian legions were not composed of the battle-hardened and victorious veterans who had campaigned with Caesar for over a decade, but were manned mainly by new levies and recruits who were not accustomed to large-scale engagements. Needless to say, they proceeded hesitantly against an enemy who was numerically superior and in an advantageous position. Sensing this, Caesar ran up and down the line encouraging his soldiers, with one of our sources claiming that he seized a shield from a soldier and advanced against the enemy by himself, saying to the officers around him that this shall be the end of his life and their military service. While he shamed them to their faces and exhorted them to advance, he was soon joined by the tribunes who took position by his side something that encouraged the rest of the army to rush towards the enemy. The bulky mass of the two armies had no room to maneuver on this rocky and inclined battleground, and cavalry action could not be easily initiated due to the rugged terrain, so the infantry was to play a decisive role. The battle proved a much longer affair than the clash at Thapsus, and the Pompeians managed to withstand the initial and most formidable charge of their adversaries. After the exchange of more than 30,000 pila, the similarly equipped and trained armies engaged in a long drawn out and exhaustive contest, in which no one seemed to be gaining the upper hand. For hours they were battling it out, with neither the Pompeians being able to break the line of their enemy nor the Caesareans being able to push back the multitude of shields that were blocking their advance. After hours of this exhaustive hand-to-hand -hand fighting, Caesar's right wing began to edge out their opponents. Once more it was the grizzled veterans of the 10th Legion who managed to take the better of their enemies, despite being severely under strength. With only a fraction of their manpower still able to fight, the men of the 10th, most of them in their 40s and 50s, who were the spearhead of numerous campaigns and battles, did what they have done countless times before, displaying an unparalleled courage and endurance as they began to push Pompey's numerically superior left flank back uphill. With this severe crisis unfolding, Pompey was forced to remove a whole legion from his right wing and bring it to the rescue of his hard-pressed left wing. This was the moment that Caesar was waiting for. He ordered his cavalry to charge directly against Pompey's weakened right wing and send part of his auxiliaries to charge Pompey's undefended camp. Labinus, who commanded the cavalry, saw the movement of Caesar's auxiliary cavalry and charged with some of the troops to intercept them. Amidst this turmoil, Pompey's hard-pressed infantry perceived Labinus's movement as an attempted retreat. It was the turning point in the battle, and soon the army of the Optimates routed in panic towards the city of Munda. The Caesareans mercilessly pursued the remnants of the Pompeian army all the way to the city of Munda, which they soon placed under siege. Thirty thousand Pompeians lay dead on the battlefield that day, while losses on the Caesarean side were much lighter, ranging around one thousand men. Munda was to be the last battle that Caesar ever fought, but it was also one of his hardest fought ones. He was later recorded as saying, I often fought for victory, but at Munda I fought for my very existence. This was the largest civil war of the ancient world. The Optimates fought against Caesar tooth and nail, and it took all of Caesar's determination, drive, genius and tenacity in order to achieve the final victory. Gaius Julius Caesar was triumphant, but his triumph would last for only one year, 
until the Ides of March 44 BC. Special thanks to our friend Hock S. Bellum for collaborating with us. He also makes animated battle videos, so make sure to check out and subscribe to his channel. Credit goes to our awesome patrons who make videos like this one possible. Consider joining them to support our work. You can also support us by subscribing to our channel and clicking the bell button to get notified when our new videos are released. And as always, thank you for watching.